thank you, Claire, and uh, good morning. And it's a pleasure to be back in, in the physical format here in Sintra. Now, as uh, already mentioned, there's also an online audience. So later on, uh, after we've had the initial presentation and, dis and discussion, uh, there will be, of course, uh, always the, the uh, interesting uh, component of having uh, questions and comments uh, from the floor, from the actual floor here in, in the room, and also uh, with also contributions online. So I, I encourage you to already start thinking about the, the questions or comments you want to make. Now, the, the team uh, in, in designing the program always has the conundrum, which is, uh, of course, the, the program is designed uh, months in advance of this event. Uh, papers have to be commissioned. And then you, the, the guesswork is, OK, what will be interesting uh, questions, interesting topics uh, by, by June 2022? Um, and uh, I think in, in this first session this morning, uh, I think a very good topic has been picked. And maybe what's interesting is uh, both of these uh, phrases are, are you know, everyday issues at the ECB, uh, globalization and labor markets. Uh, and uh, this session, uh, let's see how it goes. But in bringing these two concepts together is, is really the goal this morning. Um, and the, the, uh, we, we, ha we have to mix. We, we have uh, Richard Baldwin, who um, ha his career has been best known for, for his contributions in international trade. Of course, that's a very uh, broad concept. Um, and uh, be because of the particular intersection point here at labor markets, uh, the discussant, uh, uh, Barbara Petrangelo, is uh, one of Europe's leading labor economists. She directs the labor economics program at the CPR, as well as her chair at Oxford. So I, I think it should be a, a very interesting uh, session. I should say Richard, um, in addition to his many academic uh, direct personal contributions and his contributions to the CPR, uh, I'm sure when, when uh, they, they, they look back decades from now, uh, the, the write-up will say editor-in-chief of Vox EU. So Vox EU is, is part now of, of our daily lives, uh, now for maybe quite, quite some time, actually. Um, but it's really been such a transformational um, um, development for, for European economics to have that as a daily site uh, for, for commentaries and advertising uh, for important work. So with that, uh, let me hand over to Richard to make his presentation. Thank you. Start my watch. There we go. When I was a graduate student at MIT, they told me every talk has to have three elements to start with. You have to start with a thanks and an apology. And since it was the United States, you also had to have a joke. So let me start with my thanks. My thanks to the organizers for giving me the opportunity to share my ideas with this very august audience, very important, quite different than uh, my usual audience. Um, uh, I'm feeling a little nervous because this audience is a bit outside my usual comfort zone, so maybe I won't be thanking the organizers after I crash and burn in my uh, presentation today, but we'll see. Now, the apology is that my paper has been late and the PowerPoint presentation has been late, so I'm especially apologizing to, to Barbara, who's had to struggle with the discussion for an unwritten paper. Now, since we're in Europe rather than the US, there won't be any joke, although, uh, Maybe at the end of my presentation, some of you will figure out that the presentation was my joke. OK, did I lower the expectations sufficiently here? OK, good, good. Now let me start with the basic points. Globalization affects the functioning of the macro economy. The functioning of the macro economy affects monetary policy. And globalization is changing. It is therefore a real possibility that the functioning of the macroeconomy will change. Now, when I talk about change of globalization, think services and less goods. Over the last 25 years, globalization and automation of the goods sector, especially manufacturing, has completely transformed how our economies work. Some people say that's why the Phillips curve flattened, which has made 
policy making difficult. Some people said that's why there was so much deflation. Now, going forward, the globalization of the goods sector, which was so important for 25 years, will diminish. Globalization in the goods sector is declining. But globalization of the service sector is rising, and rather rapidly. And here's why that matters. The service sector is far larger and far more important to the macroeconomy than the goods sector ever was. Three quarters of all workers work in the service sector. Two thirds of the GDP is produced in the service sector. But services are different in important ways. And that's what I'd like to talk about, but as it turns out, there's not enough data to have that discussion. So at the end of it all, my talk should be a sales pitch for a research project that I hope the ECB will do. There we go. So that's my basic points. Uh, Mr. Moderator, should we just go to Q&A or discussion? No? As I want, okay. So, um, oh, I have some slides, so I'll, I'll go with those now. Globotics, we have to talk about globotics. Globotics is an ugly, but hopefully memorable word that I invented to try and drive home the point that globalization and robotics are being driven forward by digital technology at the same time. But this time, it's affecting white collar and professional jobs, not just manufacturing and farm jobs, and it's happening faster than many think and in ways few expect. So that's the point of this. It's coming to the service sector, both automation and globalization to the service sector. So I'm going to talk about globalization is changing. I'm going to talk about services are important but different. Then I'm going to talk about globotics, service, and HICP developments. Globalization is changing. So here's a chart that many of you will have seen before. Goods trade peaked as the offshoring expansion phase ended. So this is world goods trade, imports and exports, as a percent of GDP. And I go back to 1960, and you see from 1960 up to the early 90s, we had old-fashioned globalization driven forward by lowering trade costs and growing economies, both of which mechanically lead to a rise in the trade to GDP ratio. In the early 1990s, the ICT revolution completely changed the way globalization worked because it made it possible to spatially unbundle stages of production in manufacturing, and it made it possible for G7 firms to offshore those factories to willow wage countries. And most importantly, they offshored their know-how as well as the factories. So that offshoring triggered rapid industrialization in a handful of developing countries, which led to very quick income, which then triggered the commodity super cycle. Now, most of the low-hanging fruit in the offshoring revolution has been picked. So it's sort of come to a, a the boils come off. And for a variety of reasons we'll talk about, trade to GDP in goods is actually falling and has been for quite a while. So that global peak is for real, but it's somewhat deceptive. We need to be aware of false peaks and the lazy narrative that ICC, ICT started it, the global financial crisis killed it. That's the lazy narrative, and it's wrong. China, for example, peaked well before 2008. US peaked in 2011, Japan peaked in 2014, and the EU, which accounts for 30% of global trade in goods, never really peaked. It's kind of stagnated. So since we're at the ECB, let's look a little bit closer at the EU's peakers and non-peakers. So what I do with this graph is I put the growth between 2008 and 2020 on the vertical axis and the growth from 1990 to 2008 on the horizontal axis. So the countries that peaked are in the lower 
right corner because they grew from 90 to 2008 and they fell between 2008 and 2020. Now you can see that includes some very serious countries like Germany and France, the two largest trading countries. But if you go on the non-peakers, you see Italy, Spain, and Netherlands. So it's a bit of a mixed bag. And the EU average, the EU 27 there, is just on the borderline. So when you see that first slide, it peaks in 2008 and goes down, remember that is not a globally harmonized, sudden, synchronized movement. So when you start thinking about simplistic explanations as to why globalization died, they're almost probably all wrong for a very large number of countries. Now, China is key. I guess you've heard that before. In, in goods, China is the largest trading country in the world. In, in, uh, and it has a very particular path of this form of globalization. So this is imports and exports of goods over GDP. And you can see China rose very fast, because they were on the receiving end of the offshoring revolution. So for a long time, they were growing incredibly quickly, but importing a huge amount of parts and components. The miracle of China is they created an industrial base, and as their industrial base grew, they stopped importing the parts and components, and now they are normalizing to a usual mega economy. So China does things differently, it's state-led capital, but what they're doing macro is not unusual, it's actually they're becoming normal. Now what is unusual is on the right chart, and that's their engagement with global supply chains. So the green line is what they're buying from global supply chain parts and components, and the blue line is what they're selling. China has now become the largest by far supplier of industrial goods worldwide. Every major manufacturing country in the world is heavily dependent on Chinese industrial inputs. So it's an important thing to watch. Now this is all about goods. I wanna talk about services because goods is yesterday's story. Services is tomorrow's story. So what I'm doing with this graph here, let me come over here and bother these people instead of those people. Um, I'm looking at the growth of a large group of services called other commercial services, and I've re then also with goods, and I've rebased it to 1990 so we can see the effect of cumulative globalization, focus on the trends. And what you will see is, and this is not per GDP, this is the absolute level of, of uh, goods trade. And you can see it's rose, there's a little peak down with the global financial crisis, but it keeps going. But it's kind of petering out. Service trade, you don't see any slowing down whatsoever, potentially an acceleration. Now, over here, I show what is the ratio of other commercial services to all traded goods and services. So other commercial services is like all services except transportation and travel. So the, it's like Indian outsourcing, whatever, everything's in that bucket. And you can see from 1990, it went from 90% of global commerce to 20% of global commerce, and it's rising. So all of you in this room know what happens when one growth, when one time series grows two to three times faster than the other one, very soon the dial moves a lot. And that's my main message today. Globalization and automation of the future will be about the service sector at least as much as the manufacturing sector, so we need to study that more. Okay. So this is for the Euro area 19. You see basically the same picture. Now inside the EU, we also don't see the diversity. None, almost nobody in the, e Euro, in the EU is in this peaking uh, phase where it went up and then down. Okay, goods peaked, services not, why? And that was the subject of my 2016 book. You didn't think, Philip, that I would come up here and not advertise my book, did you? So, this is my little theory about globalization. Arbitrage drives globalization. And that arbitrage is constrained by three costs. Trade costs for arbitrage in goods, communication costs for arbitrage in know-how, and face-to-face -face costs for arbitrage in labor services. 
That first phase, when it was rising, it was all about lowering trade costs. The second phase, when the communication costs came down and allowed the offshoring, we got this boom in globalization. And what I'm saying here is that the digital technology lowering face-to-face -face cost will change globalization. In particular, Digitech is lowering face-to-face -face costs and allowing services cross-border telemigration. Think about remote work done internationally. Think about work from home when home is abroad. That's what I'm talking about. Direct labor market service arbitrage opened up by digital technology, which all of us have been using. And in fact, just a, a little hint on how bad the trade statistics are. Most of you were probably doing international trade when you did your remote work from a different country. That surely was not captured in the trade statistics. And therefore, a lot of what will go forward will not be captured in the trade statistics. OK, now I want to move on. The future of trade is intermediate services. So there's two messages there. One, the future of trade is services, not manufacturing. But almost all of our mindsets, almost all of our thinking, almost all of our wisdom is based on what happens when the good sector becomes more globalized. And I will argue that globalization of the service sector will work differently. The second message is this is not services as you may think about financial services, medical services, architectural services. It's the intermediate services, the thing that's in the service value chain. So I want to give you four facts and a conclusion or a conjecture. First of all, barriers to services and trade are much higher than barriers to services and goods now. Some estimates make them hundreds of times higher, some thousands of times higher. But most barriers to trade and intermediate services are technological, not policy. There's almost no domestic regulation of who can provide, for instance, bookkeeping services, or screen CVs, or make your appointments. Digitech is lowering barriers to intermediate services at an explosive pace, and COVID accelerated that by moving us all to the frontier. Fourth, the demand for intermediate services in rich countries is huge. The capacity in emerging markets is huge. Therefore, intermediate services and trade will grow much faster than goods and trade for the foreseeable future. And since 2000, it's already been growing two to three times faster. Okay, five facts in a short period of time, 10 minutes. Well, I have, okay. Services are important, but different. <clears throat> now, what I wanna do here is make the argument that we should pay attention to the fact that globalization and automation are shifting. First of all, services in the Euro area are important. On the left side, you'll see services accounts for 74% of the jobs. This is in 2019. By the way, I should say the, the, the president's speech was all about what happened since 2019 with COVID and Ukraine and supply shocks and stuff. I stopped there because it, services did get a little weird after that. And I'm really talking about long-term structural things. So that's one of my graphs stop at 19 or 20 on purpose. So three quarters of the jobs, two thirds of the GDP, and 44% of the HICP weight is in services. And on the right chart, we have trends, so I've rebased it to 2001 to look at the price, uh, at the uh, developments over the last 10 years, and you can see the jobs are growing uh, fast, uh, HICP weight is growing fast, and the GDP has plateaued, so the share of GDP is somewhat plateaued. Intermediate inputs are more important in service imports than manufactured imports. So all of us have fascinated about global value chains and all the implications of that, Those, that is essentially about trade in intermediate goods. That's what that all is about. But trade in services, the intermediates are more important in services than they are in goods, and it's increasing. As you can see, the business service is rising, whereas manufacturing is, is plateaued. Service intermediates are three times more important than manufactured intermediates in the overall economy. So what we have here is the column sectors. These are the inputs from the row sectors. And you see service intermediate inputs from the service sector are 32%. Service intermediate inputs into the manufacturing is 
But because the service sector is so large, 30% of the gross output of the economy is intermediate services. Now, if you go over to manufacturers, it's 5% in services, 25% in manufacturing. But since manufacturing is so small, it's only 11% of the economy. So this is, if you will, the demand for intermediate services in rich countries is huge and three times larger than the demand for intermediate goods. It affects every sector. I'll skip over that. Now what I want to talk about a little bit is automation. Service sector automation is different. And to mark that, I invented this word in my last book, my 2019 book, White Collar Robots, to stop us thinking about robots as these physical things that work in auto factories. So white computers have acquired new cognitive skills since 2000, 2016 due to machine learning. The new skills are automating service sector tasks. Things like robotic process automation, virtual assistants, IBM's Watson, scheduling apps. I just noticed that Outlook is starting to read my emails and create appointments in my calendar or suggest them by itself. That's a service sector task that's being automated. They didn't even ask me. But what changed? How is it that computers have changed? And I would argue that it's the programming that changed. There's been a fundamental sea change in the way we program computers. So coding computers is like thinking slow, conscious, rational, explicit. Machine learning is like thinking fast, coming from the Daniel Kahneman's thinking fast, thinking slow. Machine learning allows computers to do things where our thinking is unconscious, instantaneous, multi-tracked, and we have no idea how we're doing it. But by estimating large statistical models, we can reproduce that. And some of those services are allowing automation of the service sector in ways that was never possible before. It's the same technology that's allowing the globalization. Five, service sector automation is happening at the job or the task level, not the product level. And this is why it's hard to figure out. This is why my paper has no wow number at the end. So service sector automation varies by job. For instance, Frey and Osborne have a famous study which showed which jobs could be automated and which couldn't, and it's been reproduced different countries, different things. Service sector globalization or teleworkability varies by job, and Dingle and Neumann and a number of other people estimated which jobs were offshoreable and which weren't, or uh, teleworkable. By contrast, good sector globalization and automation was at the product level. So if you want to map automation and globalization in goods into the economy and HICP, it's easy. If you want to do that for services, you have to map something that's affecting occupations into HICP elements, which is difficult. We don't have that mapping, and we don't really have the data. OK, so this is the globotics quadrant, if you will. Automation and globalization of service sector occupations is happening at the same time. And all I've done here with a co-author from Japan is put the offshoreability on the vertical axis, the automatability on the horizontal axis, and put in where each occupation is according to the scores. And you can see general clerical workers with, this is US data, six million workers is up there, both automatable and offshoreable, but if you go down to public health nurses, midwives, and nurses, there's six million of them, but they're not at all offshoreable and very little automatable. But the point here is this is not an obvious correlation. So if you're thinking automation and globalization look a lot alike, as they did in manufacturing, you're wrong. You have to look at this occupation by occupation, and that's why it's hard to map into the functioning of the macroeconomy because normally we're taking products to the macroeconomy. OK. Now HIPC developments. I have three minutes and 50 seconds left. Globotics and HICP developments. <clears throat> and, and again, I'm, this is before all the exciting events that uh, all of you spend most of your time dealing with. So take this as kind of relaxation, something that might affect your predecessors. And you won't have time to worry about this, but maybe you can get your staff to worry about it. This is structural stuff. So service inflation is higher but less volatile over the long run. And there's a very good reason for that. It's called the balassa samuelson effect. So traditionally, productivity in manufacturing is faster than services, and services are less traded. 
So as a consequence, as globalization drags up the wages in, because of productivity and manufacturing, it drags up the service sector wages. And since they're not traded, they don't face a price pressure. And since they're very labor intensive, it's felt more intensively. So fast growing economies typically have higher uh, service inflation, but it's less volatile because there's none of this food and energy shock stuff that comes. <clears throat> so here's a, in the Eurozone, to, just to show you that this excess inflation of services versus industrial goods over the last 10 years is very, very common. For the average percentage point difference for the Euro area 19 is 17.5%. And what I've done here is put the size of the economy on the vertical axis <coughs> and the difference on the horizontal axis. And you can see there's a gentle that large economies tend to have less of this excess inflation than small economies. And there's also a fast growing element of it. But there's some diversity to it. OK. There's one weird thing about services, and that's communication. <coughs> its price has been falling like crazy. The other ones have been moving relatively similar. So it's not, n nothing to be seen here. In context, this is what the speech was about, so I'll skip that. Now, what I'd like to end with is the calculation I would have liked to done, to, to, to have done. When, when uh, Philippe Hartman and Philip Lane asked me uh, to do this paper, I had this idea that I could redo for the 21st century, the calculation the, the, for the 2020s, the calculations that had been done in the 2000s for the impact of imported deflation because of the China shock and whatever and off, offset by the commodity. I thought I would just take the service data, project forward what's happening, and see what it would do to the inflation. There's a trouble with that. This is how you calculate this thing, calculating the impact of service sector globalization. We would need domestic prices and import prices, and it would feed into the HICP inflation index. Now, the imported prices would also affect wage formation, which would affect domestic prices. The import competition would affect price cost markups and also affect prices. And the imported prices would lead to lower cost of inputs, therefore also lower domestic prices because of a productivity gain. Now, the trouble is there are no import prices for services. Believe it or not, they don't exist. I asked the OECD. The fundamental problem is there's no customs declarations. So the way we get trade prices, for the most part, is you fill in a customs declaration which has the value of the shipment and the quantity. And you divide the value by the quantity, you get a price, something like a price out of it. Since you're not declaring quantity for service imports, only the values, you don't have that price. So there's other ways to do it, and a research project might find them, but we don't have the price of imported services, full stop. <coughs> Moreover, the categories in which they are put seem to have been randomly drawn by people who did not care about the real economy. If you look at the service classifications, it's why did they put that together? You have like services for price line transmissions together with Indian outsourcing of offshore, stuff together like that. So we need to have better detail on the flows as well in order to be able to map them into the low labor market, into the product markets, into the cost of inputs, and therefore into the HICP. So I'm suggesting we need a forward-looking work program, we need price data, and we need mapping of imported services to domestic sectors and jobs because service sector is being hit at the job level, not the sector level, and to map the hit on the jobs, which vary by occupation, into something that matters for the functioning of the market economy, we need to map jobs into products. So I'll stop right there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Richard. I mean, the, the last point, uh, of course, is something that every day we have to deal with is uh, how do we think about uh, <coughs> measurement issues? So the grand concepts like, like inflation, then you start to press on it, and then you say, OK, the very deep questions here. Um, but uh, no, no doubt we'll come back to that in, in the discussion uh, l later on. But, but of course, the lead discussant um, is uh, Barbara, and I hand over to you. Thanks very much to the organizers for inviting me to the ECB Forum. 
and thanks to Richard who gave me the opportunity to read a lot of thought-provoking facts. And this is really an area to which I am an outsider, so I really learned quite a bit of uh, very interesting evidence. So, um, just to recap very briefly the issues that uh, Richard pointed at. So we have witnessed massive globalization in goods with the offshoring of offshoring and global supply chain for goods. And this had impacts on employment, inequality, and prices. And then now we are witnessing the next generation of international trade, and the future is going to be in services, mostly by digital technology and trade in intermediate services, as Richard was describing. This has potentially much larger reach because services account for three quarters of GDP. Every sector in the economy uses intermediate services. Demanding in rich, demand in rich countries is potentially elastic, and capacity is potentially huge in emerging markets. So the key question here is really what to expect from globalization in services, and what do we need to make progress? What kind of data, what kind of approaches we need to make progress in this area? So I will first offer a sort of labor market perspectives on the impacts of globalization in goods, and then see what we can learn, what we can extract to understand the impacts of globalization in services. So this picture here is something that probably most of you are familiar with. This is the correlation between the import penetration in a number of OECD countries and the fall in manufacturing employment. The Euro area, sorry, the European Union countries are mostly in the middle of that diagram. So the degree of import penetration was sort of intermediate at, what, at the sort of right extreme there are the US, the UK, Ireland, and Iceland. So there is a clear correlation, negative correlation, between import penetration from China and declining manufacturing employment. Now, one important point to notice is that the decline in manufacturing employment was very heterogeneous across countries, given the same level of penetration of imports from China. So what this graph shows is the change in manufacturing employment for a given increase in Chinese imports. So, for example, in Norway, in Germany, the decline in manufacturing employment after an increase in imports from China or also from other countries in the case of Germany was very close to zero, not significantly different from zero. While instead it was relatively large in the US, in the UK, and even more in Spain. So the thing about the, 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 the issues about import penetration and manufacturing employment is that, of course, import penetration is unevenly concentrated across industries, and employment effects are a lot more pronounced for low-income individuals, non-college educated, and to some extent, men. As I was showing before, employment in some countries was actually shielded, for example, in Germany and in Norway, and this was mostly due to public policies, for example, welfare policies, active labor market policies that would ease the reallocation of workers. But also, for example, there are countries at the other end of the spectrum, like Spain, where the impact was enormous because of a specific feature of the Spanish labor market with a very large incidence of temporary jobs. An important thing about uh, import penetration is that there is also a geographic aspect of inequality because manufacturing sector is relatively concentrated across space, so there have been larger differential declines in employment in areas with greater exposure to import competition. So this implied rising inequalities across areas. Okay, this is, I'm afraid this, these are like microdata coming from the UK. This is simply giving you an idea of who is most exposed to international trade. So basically, women of all education groups are less exposed than men, and within each gender, workers with low qualifications or no qualifications at all are more exposed than educated workers. What is uh, more sort of recent in the research, but very, very important to the topic of this forum, is the impact of uh, uh, manufacturing, uh, sorry, sorry, exposure to uh, manufacturing trade to prices. And here, latest estimates find very large effects on prices and inflation. Indeed, I was talking about manufacturing, but the evidence I'm presenting here refers to more than 200 product categories, including both manufacturing goods and services. Services are a minority, but services are already there. And there are researchers at the LSE who found that there is a very strong association between the increase in import penetration and the fall in inflation. 
So basically, the result of these studies is a one percentage point increase in import penetration from China causes a fall in inflation by more than two percentage points. So this is a very large impact. And what is perhaps more interesting is the channel through the channels through which impacts is taking play, are taking place. So you can have prices of imported goods and also broader impacts on the prices of locally produced goods. And this research argues that this is where most of the impact has taken place. And the reason why there was a strong impact on the prices of locally produced goods was mostly due to changes in markups, changes in market structure. Domestic producers were having to compete with rising productivity from Chinese producers and their market were falling. So this is the main channel through which the uh, increase in import penetration affected inflation. So this is the correlation between the change in markups and uh, exposure to international trade. The relationship is negative and it's even stronger if you look at sectors of the domestic economy, for example, the US economy, in which market concentration is higher. So there is a strong impact on market concentration. Um, putting things together, inflation and employment, one percentage point increase in import penetration, as I was saying before, causes a 2.2% 2 .2 percentage point falls in inflation, but also a fall in employment of 1.8 percentage point. The fall in inflation could be factored in into a rising consumer surplus. So here there is a very ballpark figure of an increase in about $450,000 in surplus for each job that is displaced by international trade, which makes it possible basically to compensate those who suffer job losses. And also there are distributional impacts through the composition of expenditure. So one could argue that import penetration rose faster for products that sell relatively more to high income groups, for example, electronics. But at the same time, the price response was larger for product groups that sell to lower income households, for example, appliances, shoes, uh, apparel, etc. So overall, high income groups, sorry, low income groups, I should say here, so, uh, benefit proportionally more. So it's low income group, it's not high income groups. Okay. There is also quite a lot of evidence of broader impacts of international trade in goods through for example, fishes in the fabric of society, changes in the ideology, changes in electoral outcomes. I will not talk much about this because perhaps we have to make very different statements about services. We don't know yet, but the composition of the penetration of trading services is actually quite different from the composition of the penetration in trading goods. So this is what I had in mind about service penetration. This is also what Richard was showing about the importance of the trading services because services is part of every sector of the economy. And this is true in all economies in the European Union. So here I'm giving you data for just a bunch of those economies, but it's very, very consistent across countries. And most importantly, if we want to think about winners and losers, then perhaps we need to figure out that the inequality impacts on trading services are going to be quite different from the impacts on inequality that we've witnessed from the trading goods. So for example, if you look at the goods sector, on the, uh, which are the blue bars, the share of female is relatively low, is just above one quarter, and the share of college educated is also relatively low, just below one quarter. If you look at the service sector, the gender composition is almost completely balanced, 50% women and men, and there is a much higher proportion of college-educated workers. So on the gender side, we might expect a larger relative impact on female employment than what we have seen with the globalization in goods. And this is kind of important because much of the increase in female participation over the past 50 years or so was also aided to some extent by the rising services, which is traditionally a very female-intensive sector. So women have sort of been shielded from the impact of international trade because they were underrepresented in the manufacturing sector. This is not going to be the case with trading services. And secondly, the incidence of college education is a lot higher in services, and this is just the total service sector. This is the average service sector, but of course the incidence of college education is a lot higher in the kind of services that are open to international competition, for example, financial services, computer services, professional services. Now, what Richard was lamenting is something to which we can all relate, the lack of data, especially data on imported services, 
So the kind of evidence I will show here, I'm afraid will not come from the kind of services that Richard had in mind in terms of high skill financial services or professional services or computer services, but will come from the other end of the spectrum of services, which are nevertheless traded with a very specific program called the European Posting Policy. So I think the evidence from the European Posting Policy is kind of interesting because it really gives us an idea of what to expect when there is international competition in services. So this, with this scheme, jobs in non-tradable sectors are being onshored on site. So it's mostly about construction, cleaning, driving services, a lot of manual service tax. So foreign firms, for example, firms in Poland, perform services in the customer's country, for example, in Germany, where the workers are only temporarily located. So posted workers stay formally employed in the sending country, but perform their services and sell their services in the receiving country. So what kind of services we're talking about is this kind of uh, pink red area that I've shaded in this picture. So it's about 25% of the total international trade in services and it's almost 75% of the total flows of workers. So talking about within EU workers' flow, if you look at France, to which this uh, picture refers, about 75% of the inflows of workers to France are coming through the European Posting Service. So this is, this is playing a huge role, and it has been increasing over time, much faster than migration, international migration within the EU. What kind of skills, what kind of occupations we are talking about? These are very low skill jobs, so manual jobs, mostly blue collar, a little bit of uh, technicians. It's, it's really mostly like manual services, like truck driving, cleaning, and also in construction. What was the impact of that at the receiving end? This graph here shows the impact of job posted workers on the receiving firms in France so there are two things, two important things to notice. Employment in those firms is falling after the liberalization of the job posting. And it's falling very similarly to what we were witnessing for international trading goods. So workers are displaced from those occupations that are now performed by offshore workers. Now, another important point here, which might be important for both inequality and inflation, if you look at the orange line in that diagram, that is completely flat. So there is no impact whatsoever on local wages. So in a sense, this effect, this result mimics to some extent what we have learned from the migration literature. In most studies, we don't really observe a detrimental impact of migration on wages. And this is something that is replicated here, looking at something that is more similar to the export of services rather than permanent migration. So why does that happen? It can happen for various reasons. One reason why this is not happening is there isn't out migration of workers. So this is not happening because there are general equilibrium effects that local workers migrate out of areas where posted workers arrive. This is mostly because Incumbent workers, local workers, typically are protected by wage negotiation, and in some cases they're bumped up the occupation ladders by the arrival of these kind of temporary migrants. Now, in the very little time left, I'll give you a very brief snapshot of what one can expect from the change in welfare, from this kind of job posting policy. In this case, welfare mostly accrues to the sending countries. So this uh, calibration about welfare refers to the sending countries. So for example, Poland in the previous example. For the sending countries, this implies an enormous increase in welfare, a remarkable increase in welfare, mostly due to higher wages at destination and higher increases in productivity in the sending firms. So to sort of wrap up and conclude, what kind of takeaway points can we learn from existing evidence in international trading goods and what can be exported to uh, evidence on uh, uh, international trading services? So evidence from the past two decades has taught lessons on various impacts of globalization in goods. So we have seen changes in employment, inequality, and inflation. Much less in no is known about globalization in services to which the exposure in rich country will be much larger. Now, one point about globalization in services is that employment changes will not be as concentrated across groups of workers, and most importantly, will not be as concentrated geographically as we've seen for manufacturing goods trade. 
So basically, the impacts on inequality are probably different. And now the important question is probably at time of rising inflation, rising concerns about inflation, the question is, will globalization in services help to reduce prices or to slow down inflation? Now, the evidence here is at very early stage, but whatever evidence is available points to the fact that the impact of price of services is very similar to the impact of price of goods. So the kind of the few studies that we have point to very similar impacts in terms of inflation. Now, I should also mention that those studies have an approach that is more modest than what Richard was advocating before, because those studies cannot use detailed prices of imported services. They typically take a reduced form approach and they look at the correlation between trade openness in various services, intermediate, uh, intermediate sectors as well, and the correlation between final prices. So we don't know the whole chain of transmission, but the evidence that we have so far is relatively similar to what we know from, from goods. Now, of course, this evidence is too limited and it's still too early to extrapolate to the broader, bigger picture when service trade will expand further. Thank you very much. Thank you, Barbara, for a very interesting uh, discussion. And if you take the uh, presentation and the discussion, you can see this is a, a huge topic. It covers uh, such a wide range. And uh, I think uh, some of the other topics we didn't even get to it, uh, so far is, of course, um, the interconnection with also uh, multinational firms. Because again, you might imagine, uh, I mean, we know already a, a lot of services trade is within the firm. So I don't go and search the world for um, the suppliers of services, but if I contract with some domestic firm, they may well be outsourcing within the firm or to their partners uh, around the world uh, uh, to, to provide those services, intermediate services. Uh, and uh, also, when we, whenever we talk about globalization here in the European Union, there's also the dimension of, okay, is it different within the single market? And for services, with, with the posted worker point that Barbara raised, and other ways that a single European labor market uh, works, uh, it's, it's probably quite different. So with that, uh, let, let me try and collect uh, some questions, uh, initially for, from here in the room, and then let's see online. So please, uh, um, you, you may be rusty about putting up your hand, but the, the history of Sintra is, is people are well able to put up their hand. Uh, so I, I see two, so I'm gonna go with, with uh, Kristen Forbes and then with, with Volker. So Kristen? And um, please wait for the mic, of course. Thanks very much. So there's this fact out there that the shared global component of CPI inflation has increased quite dramatically, but there has not been an increase in the shared global component of service inflation, wage inflation, core inflation. Or put slightly differently, um, if you look at, say, advanced economies, uh, global factors seem to be driving about 90% of the movement in CPI inflation but global factors do not play nearly as big a role in wage inflation, core inflation, in the role of uh, the global component of sort of core inflation, wage inflation has not increased over time since 2000, since 2010, whatever the starting point is. So I've been trying to square that fact with all the results you presented on this globalization of services, increased trade of services. I hit a couple of potential explanations for what seems like a disconnect, because it seems like as service trade increases, services become more globalized, it should play a bigger role in shared inflation around the world. So I hit a couple potential hypotheses. I was wondering if you could tell me if you buy any of them or what I'm missing. Um, one theory is that, according to your graphs, the globalization of services is just taking off. So maybe we're just not seeing the impact on sort of domestic service inflation around the world yet. Maybe it's just coming, it's just starting. Um, second potential explanation, as you showed us, that there's a lot more volatility in goods prices, commodity prices, service inflation is going up but it's not as volatile. So maybe it's not driving changes in inflation around the world the same way. You know, monetary policy can respond, et cetera. It's like a trend that's just taken out. A third hypothesis is that uh, service inflation, global service inflation will not pass through the same way because there's just a lot of intermediary factors. And there's markups, pricing competition, uh, margins, all of that is different for services. So even if you get big movements in global service inflation, it's not going to affect domestic economies the same way. 
So that's three potential hypotheses. I'm wondering if you think any of those are the explanation or if there's something I'm missing. You know, why basically, so the bottom line is why is globalization of services is taken off? Are we not seeing it pass through into uh, domestic inflation rates to the same way? Okay, P probably sufficient to collect some questions, Richard. So if you can pass to, the, uh, to, to Volker over here. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is just triggered by a comment Richard Baldwin made or pointed out. Uh, the, you said the, for the trade in intermediate commercial services, the main constraints or barriers were technological and not policy, and as technology changed, uh, you could have a quick increase in this um, outsourcing in intermediate services. So I'm wondering if we're not ahead or already in the middle of, a develop, of developments where you have substantial policy-induced barriers to that. Let me say some examples. With the conflict in Russia and the sanctions, we realized the power of the sanctions, setting constraints, say, on financial flows. We have cyber attacks, cyber war. So um, there are uh, you know, things where you have to defend yourself against. If you look at potential conflict with China, we see that how they uh, basically uh, developed parallel systems, their own internet, their own platforms to be able to control them. And the new technology also helps governments to control, right? The new AI machine learning opens up. So going forward in terms of this may still happening, but also the comparative advantage, which country you want to outsource to may also be very much uh, influenced by the new, I'm, I'm asking, may also be influenced very much by the new uh, strategic considerations. I mean, who is more likely to be an ally or neutral or an opponent? So, okay, th th thank you. I'll just take uh, one more from Hel Helen Ray. So, if you can pa pass the mic over on this side. Here. It's okay, uh, Helen. Here. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so, I, I wanted to go back to the interpretation of the excess inflation and the Balasa Samuelson uh, that you. Uh, uh, mentioned. So in Vanessa Samuelson, there are two important um, assumptions. Uh, one is the law of one price for, for tradable goods, and the other one is the difference in productivity between uh, tradables and non-tradables, and we are used to thinking of those two in giving a relative price increase uh, when you have a productivity catch-up in the manufacturing sector, hence a real appreciation of countries catching up to the technological frontier, and this is why, you know, in countries uh, uh, which are relatively rich countries, we also have higher price level because the price of services is, is higher. But everything that you pointed out to me seems to indicate that there's more tradability in services. So something more like the low of one price to, to services might be starting maybe to, to kick in to some extent for some services. And similarly, that some of the services being uh, you know, closer to automation, not all of them, as you pointed out, might lead to relative, relative productivity increase in the service sector. So again, that's a, a force moving in the opposite direction. So how do we reconcile then the relative price movements uh, with these two uh, kind of forces that you showed in your, in your underlying data? Thank you, so, so Richard, let's see if you've uh, responses to, to those uh, uh, questions. Thanks, Christine. Uh, she, she asked her question and she answered it too, very eloquently. I thought that was great. Uh, appreciate that. Um, so the share of uh, globalization, it's re this is all about the correlation of inflation and globalization. If you plot the two, it looks hugely, and, and that was generating a lot of the, they called it the glo uh, globalized inflation hypothesis in the 2000s, and there was, people spent a lot of time looking at that and, and breaking it down. Um, so it, why isn't that going on in services, for instance? So three, I, I would point out, I mean, everything you said was correct, but I would point out for three things. First of all, the HICP services are systematically non-traded. So for example, the subcomponents are housing. Hard to argue that, that even in the most globalized world that that would be globalized. Miscellaneous, of course, that's services. That nobody knows what it is. Hmm. Recreation which is pretty local, transportation, which is, this is local transportation, and communications, which is globalized and has had that coming down. So the first thing I think is, is that the, the HIPCs, when you talk about the impact of service globalization on inflation, it is systematically taking out the tradable things, which are the intermediates, 
So I don't expect the same correlation ever to, to come through. It would have to come through those other things, the imported services affecting wage formation, pr wage prices, and the inputs into all the economies. So I think that if we ever had the data, it would come, come through those channels. Um, the uh, <clears throat> other is I, th I think it's just started. So there's a reason why we've essentially ignored services. That's because they weren't very important in trade and automation. Because automation and globalization, something that happened in farms and factories, not offices. So although it was super important, nothing exciting was happening in services, so we didn't lavish lots of attention and research on it. But the argument here is that digital technology is accelerating both the automation, because of machine learning automating service tasks that could not be automated before, and globalization, because really good remote technology is allowing foreigners to work in our offices and teams in ways they never did before. So it's still coming. And that, that's, it, it, uh, I would say that's the main thing is it, it's coming. Volker, the backlash. Well, thank you for asking for that. That's chapter seven in my latest 2019 book. The title was a globotics upheaval. And in that book, I was trying to get people excited that this globalization and automation was gonna lead to a future of work where office and professional jobs workers were very upset, just like the factory workers before, and they would push back. And I have a whole series of ways of how they might do that. But the problem is, is it's way harder than you might imagine. And it's closely related to the problem of taxing, putting a value-added tax on services. It's very hard to know where a service was made, or where it's coming from, or what it's valued, in ways that somebody couldn't cleverly monkey around with it. So once you try and start, for instance, taxing imports of service intermediates, you'll have very difficult problems with uh, diversion. <clears throat> the second is, do you really want the government looking at every internet flow to see if it's a service that should be taxed or regulated? Because that's what you'd actually have to do. You'd have to pass services trade through a customs post in order to tax it or control it the way it was before. Or you go to the companies who are buying it and you impose very strict regulations on them on what they can do. Now, in some industries that exists, for instance, medical. Privacy makes it very difficult to offshore certain sets. And in Switzerland, for instance, with privacy on banking, they never outshore the back office stuff because they're afraid of violating the uh, privacy things. So it's possible, but, but it's way harder than you might imagine. And you'll notice that MC12, if we had had Ngozi here, she would have told us that they renewed the digital moratorium on taxing digital flows. Not because they didn't want to, but because finally they realized it was impractical. <coughs> Excuse me. So I don't think they're going to be able to do it easily unless they do something very radically. Helene, so the... <clears throat> Uh, I agree totally, and thank you for making those points. So I brought out Balasa Samuelson to explain why in the past, inflation has been so different than goods. Uh, and you, you're, it was a dead on point that what I'm saying is both, several of those things are gonna change. Pro we may see productivity advances in services and we may see them tradable. So to a certain extent, that was the paper I, I would, that was gonna be the wow number that I didn't get to which was, you know, if services continue at this pace in 20 years, it will have depressed inflation by 20 points or something like that. So I, I, I agree very much with what you said, and, and thank you for pointing out that the Blasa Samuelson was history, and moving forward, we're moving out of Blasa Samuelson. Actually, somebody here in the room ought to write a new paper. Mm -hmm. Both Blasa and Samuelson, I think, are no longer with us, so we, should, we, need a, we need a new one. Okay, thank you very much for that. Thank you. Let me just see, Barbara, do you have any extra comments to make? Or? Okay. Okay, so let me just uh, see um, if, if there's any more comments or questions. Uh, we're starting to run a little bit late, but, but just in case. So, um, but if not, no doubt these, uh, uh, I mean, I think it will be a sign of success that uh, people uh, leave, leave the session having, I think, a lot more to think about because uh, this, this topic and maybe the nature of the paper, the nature of these uh, questions and answers, as you say, is uh, very much something that we're going to be uh, uh, dealing with for, for many years to come. Um, and uh, a lot of deep issues ha have been raised. So with that, let, let's close this uh, first session. And let me thank again uh, Richard and, and Barbara. Thank you. <laughs>